Okay, in chapter 16, part 3, we're going to talk about diels alder reactions, but it's specifically one type of pericyclic reaction. Now, pericyclic reactions come in three flavors, and they all what they all have in common is a cyclic flow of electrons. Um, there are the oh sorry okay the cyclo addition I thought it was in a list the electrocyclic and the sigma tropic rearrangement. We are only going to cover the cyclo addition reactions. So you will note that this lecture will cut off before. Uh, or this lecture series will stop before chapter 16 actually ends. And that's why we're focusing just on cycloadditions here. Now, all three types have several common uh, uh, elements. They have a concerted mechanism. A little review of a vocab word there. Means all of the uh, bonds that break and form during that reaction break and form at the same time. Right, so it's it's a one-step mechanism. That mechanism involves that ring of electrons I was talking about. Your transition state is cyclic. Those two kind of go together there. And the polarity of the solvent generally has no effect. Um, uh, like you saw when you talked about substitution and elimination, sometimes uh, polar versus nonpolar, protic versus aprotic, uh, the, the solvent types can have an effect on the reaction. In this case, it, re it generally has no effect. In the cycloaddition reactions, we're going to be seeing a change in two sigma bonds, uh, or increase two sigma bonds, decrease two pi bonds. Um, we aren't, again, we're not going to go over the other two types. So the Diels-Alder reaction is the, the main type of cycloaddition that we're going to be interested in. And this is an important classic reaction. Anytime we make new carbon-carbon bonds, organic chemists are really excited. Nobel Prizes are given. It's an all-around important and exciting time. The main features of the Diels-Alder reaction are that it makes a cyclic product, a six-membered ring. So this gives us access to a lot of uh, variety in our organic molecules that we can make. And they always start off with a diene, right? That's why it's in this chapter. We're in conjugated diene territory. And then something called a dienophile. And I'm actually going to change this a little bit. And I I recommend that you do too. We're not going to make that an X. We're going to uh let's let's make that a Y. X stands in for halogens usually, and halogens actually one of the few electron withdrawing groups you aren't going to see in that position. So I'm going to switch that to Y. From these two reagents, you get a six-membered ring with one double bond, and then you still, Y will still be attached. It's called a 4-2 cycloaddition because <clears throat> you have four pi electrons combining with two pi electrons. All right, the diene has two double bonds, two pi bonds, four electrons total. Dienophile has one. The mechanism is super, super simple. <clears throat> Something that you have to be careful with with sapling is where the arrow stops. Um, but depending on, you know, where your pictures come from, there's two acceptable ways to draw the uh, end point of your arrow. One pi bond is going to break. And it's going to form a sigma bond with a carbon in that di in that dienophile. Now you can't have five bonds on carbon, so it pushes that pair of pi electrons out, and it forms a sigma bond with the other side of your diene. Again, we don't want to have 
five bonds on carbon. So that's what happens to those pi electrons. It forms this pi bond that you see in the product. Now you'll notice I very specifically made the arrows go to the, to the atoms, right? Uh, the first arrow I drew goes to this carbon atom here because that's the electrons are forming that new sigma bond. This arrow starts at the pi bond and ends at this carbon right here. In the PowerPoint slide, however, you do see the pi electrons kind of going into this space here because they are creating that sigma bond. That's perfectly okay if you're drawing it freehand. But just keep in mind, sapling might want you to actually direct it to the atom. Both are fine for me. It's a one-step mechanism, right? It's concerted. All of the pi bonds that are breaking, the sigma bonds that are forming, it's all happening at one time. So you just see one maxima uh, on this reaction coordinate. You see the transition state up at the top is that cyclic uh, transition state. You have that ring of electrons. This reaction is reversible, right? So when, you were work, when you're working on your lab, you'll note there's a lot of discussion about not heating uh, the product too much when you're doing the recrystallization because it can reverse, right? The reverse reaction otherwise known as retro deals alder. It just breaks that product up back into the starting materials. And it's usually under high heat. All right, so I like to study this reaction both forwards and backwards. You're gonna find various practice problems where we I give you starting materials and ask you to move forward, or I give you the product and I ask you to move back. That's where it's really important to know where those new sigma bonds are going to form. We're going to get lots of practice on this as we move through this lecture. <clears throat> there is a discussion of uh, thermodynamics in this chapter. You welcome to get into it. I am not going to ask you anything about delta G, delta H, or delta S. So we're going to take a closer look at the diene and the dienophile at the two different reagents. So let's start off with the diene. Now, the simplest diene and dienophile, are we starting with the diene or the diene? So, uh, no, we're going to start off with the dienophile, silly me. Okay, now you can get a reaction between uh, one three butadiene and ethane, but it's difficult. You have to apply a lot of heat and the yield isn't particularly good. And so this reaction works best if we have some sort of electron withdrawing group. Electron withdrawing because there needs to be some impetus for this reaction to start. For these electrons to be attracted to that dienophile, it's really helpful if there is something that is pulling electrons away so you do actually have a partial positive, right? Everything happens with chemical reactions because negatives attracted to positive, right? And so what kind of electron groups will you see? Well, Y will typically be some sort of carbonyl. Right, if the carbonyl is directly attached to the double bond, it'll be a great withdrawing group. Now, what's attached to it? It could be a hydrogen, it could be an R group, it could be an OR, an ester, it could be a carboxylic acid. The only other group I would ask you to know would be the nitrile. A nitrile is also a good electron withdrawing group. Nitrogen is another heter heteroatom like oxygen. So these are the electron withdrawing groups you are most likely going to see. And then just note, we don't have to use 200 degrees Celsius, we get 100% yield. It makes all the difference in the Diels-Alder reaction. 
as we are studying the dienophile, something that we want to take note of. Stereochemistry is retained. So if your dienophile is, and we'll just put Y groups, is a cis reagent, then it will lead to a cis product. And if it's trans, you will get a trans product. So you have a couple of examples over here. I'm going to draw something slightly different just so we have more examples. But let's say we have uh, CHO. CHO is the standard abbreviation for an aldehyde. My diels alder reaction, I'm going to have one, two, three arrows if I'm going to show my mechanism. I'm going to make a ring. My double bond shifted. Now, the aldehydes are trans to one another, so they are going to be trans to each other on the ring. One wedge, one dash. The um, you'd also have an enantiomer. Sometimes you will see it written like this, plus en. You don't have to write it, but that's what that's the reason. It would just be changing the position of the wedge and the dash. If you have anything on the diene, let's say there's a let's just put a methyl group there. Nothing would happen to it. Let's, in this case, let's use nitriles. And they're cis to one another. Well, in the product, again, one, two, three. The product, we are going to shift that double bond. That methyl group doesn't go anywhere. And now either they are both going to be wedge or they are both going to be dash. In this case, you'd also have an enantiomer because it's not symmetric. Again, you don't have to say plus an antimer. But you're going to maintain that stereochemistry. Another type of dienophile that you may encounter and you need to be prepared for is the alkyne. If you put an electron withdrawing group on an alkyne, uh, in fact, let's just use Y again here, it works just as well. And the only, or the main difference Right, it's the same mechanism. You have three arrows, but only one pi bond is breaking. So in your product, you do have that shift of that bond there, but across the ring, you will still have a pi bond. And now your Y group will be there. And you know what? If there was a Y group on both sides, you wouldn't show wedges or dashes. Stereochemistry is still maintained. There isn't cis or trans across a, a triple bond, and there isn't cis or trans on that double bond in the ring. It's flat. If you draw it as wedged and dashed, um, you're drawing something bent in a weird way. So when there is a double bond, don't use wedges and dashes. And you have an example over here where you have esters instead of Y groups. All right, so we've talked a little bit about the dienophile. You know that you are looking for um, certain electron withdrawing groups. You're looking to re retain your uh, stereochemistry. And now you also are looking at alkynes as dienophiles. So let's switch gears a little bit. Let's talk about what is necessary for the diene. The diene must be in the S cis conformation. So most of the time we write 1, 3 butene in, you know, in this, uh, is the S trans conformer. Because that's usually the easiest to draw. It is also the most stable. But we know that there is rotation around that single bond. So it is spending some of its time as S cis, which is good. It needs to be able to do that to react as in a deals alder. That allows us uh, to make a comparison. So before we move on, I want to ask a question. If we were 
comparing one uh, three butadiene with cyclopentadiene with uh, let's see. this cyclohexadienyl type structure. And I'm gonna draw the other one down here because I want to space it out. And this diene. And I asked you to rank them from uh, fastest in a Diels-Alder reaction to slowest in a Diels-Alder reaction based solely on the fact that you know it has to be in the S cis conformation to react. One of these molecules, and so we're gonna say fastest is number one, slowest is number four. Number one has got to be cyclopentadiene because every single molecule will be in the S cis conformation. You can't rotate around that single bond because it's locked into a ring. So every single molecule that has enough energy to react will react because it's in the right conformation. Now, I'm going to take a moment because both this one can rotate and this one can rotate. This one, however, cannot rotate. It is locked into S trans. So this one, I mean, we can call it number four, but it doesn't react. It's not slow, it just, it does nothing. It can never rotate and get in the S cis conformation, so it will never make a Diels Alder product. So now it's just down to two and three. Two and, or both of these molecules have that rotation and can get into the S uh, cis conformation. However, this one just has little tiny hydrogen sticking out, whereas this one on the bottom has the big T butyl groups that when it twists into position will be forced closer together. And so there is some steric hindrance. So we would expect the less hindered one to be the second fastest and the, the more hindered one to be the third. And so that's one way we can analyze our dienes. All right, and so you get that note here. No reaction if it can't get into the right conformation. Now, as we think about dienes and we look at something like cyclopenadiene, cyclopenadiene is a great Diels Alder reagent because everything is, you know, ready to go. But it presents a new challenge. We haven't seen a cyclic diene react yet. So let's go ahead and just take, uh, in fact, I am going to put these X groups on the same side rather than on opposite sides. Because I want us to talk about the two different isomers we could form. We're gonna draw the same arrows. Sometimes it may be helpful to give yourself some numbering so just so you can keep track of what's attaching to what. If we go and draw our first arrow, that is the new bond between carbon one and carbon six. The pi bond breaks and that's gonna form a new bond between four and five. And then this pi bond of course shifts. Now, let's think about what that looks like. There's two different ways that you can draw this. I am gonna start off with the aerial view because sometimes I find that students can see that better and then we'll shift into this view. You could draw it either way in uh, any reports for me, but you need to be able to read either on a screen. So you need to be prepared for both. But as I'm, as I'm teaching you, as we're practicing, Let's start off by making our new ring. We know that this is one, two, three, four, five, six. Between two and three, we have a double bond. Between one and four, we have, and I'm gonna make it wedged. We're gonna put that CH2 coming out towards us. 
That's this CH2 right here. One and four are still connected. Now, the X groups are on five and six. They're either both gonna be wedged or they're both gonna be dashed. So if they are both dashed, if they are going away from that bridge, this is called the endo product. If they are both going into the, or to the same side as the bridge. So let's draw that here. So we have our little bridge coming towards us and now we're going to put our X groups on the same side of the ring. This is the XO product. There's a different way to draw it as you see over here. So we'll just make a little note. Hopefully you are taking notes in a more logical fashion. But the endo, what you're seeing, instead of looking at the six-membered ring from the top, think about looking at it more from the side. So you have your six-membered ring, and this is one, two, three, four, five, and six. In this case, you don't use wedges or dashes. You're looking at it from the side, so we're using up and down. Think of it's similar to the chair. You have your bridge. That's that CH2. Instead of coming out towards you, it's going up. The endo product would have the X groups going down. Again, not wedges or dashes, it would be going down. There would be hydrogens that would be going up. The XO product, you draw it out the same way. You have your bridge, your double bond, except for the X groups are going up and the hydrogens are going down. And that's the difference between exo and endo. And what you need to know, what you need to write down in your notes and commit to memory, is that we typically expect the endo to be the major product. Now, in your Deals Alder lab, you're gonna come across an explanation of when and why you might get exo product. But when you are predicting products for me, on a test or a quiz, what I want you to do is I want you to predict the endo product. That is going to typically be your major product. Now, cyclopentadiene is kind of a little interesting um, molecule. It's so reactive that even though this doesn't seem like the greatest dienophile, it will react with itself in a Diels-Alder reaction and make dicyclopentadiene. In fact, it does this so quickly and so rapidly that if you buy a bottle of cyclopentadiene at room temperature, you got a bottle of dicyclopentadiene. I'm sorry, if you buy this bottle of di, uh, cy oh goodness, cyclopentadiene, this is really what's in the bottle. I, in fact, when I was uh, a teaching assistant, and we did a Diels Alder reaction in my lab. We had to use this starting material that our boss kept in a still and kept it constantly boiling, right? Kept it at high temperature. So it was always forced to go in the reverse retro Diels Alder reaction. And that's how you could actually get cyclopentadiene. So it's important to know the reactivities of these molecules. A little bit of explanation on endo versus exo. And uh, that has to do with that cyclic transition state, of course. Anytime you can lower the energy of the transition state or of the intermediates, the, uh, the more likely you are to make that isomer, that particular um, uh, conformation. And in this case, it helps to see it in a little bit more of a 3D way. Uh, here we go. You think of your diene as this flat conjugated pair of electrons. You have all those pi electrons, right? Now, there are two directions that your dienophile can come. The electron withdrawing group can be pointed in towards all of that conjugation, or it can be pointed away. Well, 
endo is when they're pointed in. And what happens is as this bond is starting to form, these pi electrons are able to overlap a little bit with the pi electrons either in the carbonyl or in the nitrile. And anytime those pi orbitals can overlap, it can spread that electron density out a little bit. It's going to make it more stable. And that's the reason why endo is often uh, predicted as the major product. All right, it's you see that thermodynamic versus kinetic again. So what I want you to think of, because a lot of times we like to do Diels-Alder reactions because you don't have to heat them up a lot, we often get that kinetic product. It forms faster. With a lot of heat, we may see exo. But again, please make note, I want you predicting endo, and then you can explain exo in your, uh, using your lab manual in your lab. We are going to finish up the conversation about regioselectivity and the Diels-Alder reaction in the fourth and final part of chapter 16.